Exactly five months ago today, I was seated in the back of a fully armored SUV. Two burly men bearing AK-47s in the front seat pulling into a military base in northern Iraq. We were given our standard greeting by more men armed with automatic weapons and a mirror plunged under our truck to check for explosives. After being given the okay, we were escorted out of the truck to the sting of the 120 degree Iraqi summer heat where I waited to be greeted by Peshmerga general. I would ask him what I would continue asking soldiers and citizens around the world until, well, last week, which was, what do you think of your country's military? The reason for that is I've spent the last six months traveling to 11 countries as Vanderbilt's Keegan Traveling Fellow. I've interviewed 200 people. I've spoken with pacifists in London, separatists in Ukraine, and IDF soldiers in Israel. My goal was fairly simple. I wanted to understand the relationship between people and the military in other nations. I know what you're thinking. It is just the conversation you want to strike up with someone behind you in line at a coffee shop. It turns out, shockingly, no one wants to talk to you about their view on the military when they're trying to order a vanilla latte. The person taking your order, however, has a much more difficult time evading your questions because they can't run, and it's considered bad business to tell a customer to leave the country and never come back. <laughs> Were I to ask you all the same question I asked that general in Iraq, you'd all most likely say something positive and respectful about our military. After all, most Americans do. In fact, 80% of Americans say they have confidence in the military to act in their best interest, making it the most trusted public institution, more than three times as trusted as our elected officials. It probably comes as no surprise that Americans trust their military. We acknowledge their service on Veterans Day annually. We write cards to soldiers overseas. We even somewhat amazingly set aside our airport angst when we let military personnel board flights first. But how much do we actually know about the military as an institution? That's what I want to discuss here today the disconnect between our worship for the military and ignorance of how it functions. I can't explain this entire gap to you in a short talk, but hopefully you'll leave with a clearer picture of our own relationship with the military. Most of us in this room, including myself, grew up in the post 9-11 generation. If you're the same age that I am, you quite literally don't remember what it's like to live in a country that isn't at war. Yet, quite ironically, as New York Times reporter C.J. Chivers puts it, America is not at war. The military is at war. America is at the shopping mall. He seems to hit the mark here. Despite the fact that we know nothing but a nation at war, here at places like Vandy, we don't feel the effects of a 17-year war day to day. We wake up, we drudge to class, we eat ran cookies, we go to Rippies and country concerts. Our personal lives are far from impacted by the wars fought overseas, causing us to be detached from our soldiers and naive about their duties. When Americans were asked to guess the size of the military, most were wrong by an average of about 5 million people. When asked to guess the size of the Marine Corps, off an entire order of magnitude. For reference, our Marines are about this big. Americans think they're about this big. I was curious about these stats on our own campus, so I polled 183 Vanderbilt students. When asked to guess the number of branches in the military, more than half could not guess them correctly. When asked to estimate the budget for the Department of Defense, the average answer was $3.6 trillion, about $3 trillion off. Do you guys know how much money $3 trillion is? With this kind of defense budget, forget Elon Musk, our military could have seven spaceships on Mars by now. Clearly, although Americans strongly support and trust our military, we lack a rudimentary understanding of its size, funding, demographics, limits, and capabilities. A public that knows so little about the military while claiming such great confidence is bound to be misguided about what it can accomplish and then disappointed at outcomes that fall short of those aspirations. Growing up in Kentucky, I didn't have big dreams of investigating international militaries. I went to Vandy after all, and I'm sure my parents were rethinking the whole follow your passion thing when I 
told them that passion meant turning down a well-playing cubicle job and traveling around the world alone to talk to a bunch of guys with guns and bombs. <laughs> but once I wrapped my head around our relationship with the military, another question kept gnawing at me. Does this gap between civilians and the military really matter? After examining this question around the world, I've witnessed exactly why it matters. I was once interviewing a retired general in Lebanon who said to me, Danielle, you Americans just don't get it. In this corner of the world, if we make our military strong like yours, they just overthrow the government. The fact that civilians control our military and our military accepts and understands such civilian control is, by contrast, truly incredible. But it comes with responsibility. An engaged and active citizenry is requisite for the proper functioning of such civilian control. Citizens that cannot or will not engage throw that system into turmoil. No institution and no military is infallible. Unless we understand how to do better, we're at risk of witnessing that relationship disintegrate. So what is it we should actually know about the military in order to bridge this gap? There are not nearly enough minutes allotted to this talk to even scratch the surface. And you don't have to learn everything, but learn something. To help us learn about the military, I began reaching out to my military friends and asking, what are the most common civilian misconceptions about you? I compiled some facts from their assessments. Fact one, people join the military for numerous reasons. I was once speaking with a military spouse who was taken aback when her friends, upon learning she was dating an officer in the military, asked her, so what's it like to date someone who didn't go to college? Like those friends, many civilians assume everyone who joins the military is poor and uneducated. On the contrary, the military is, on average, more educated than the general population. In 2014, almost 84% of military officers had at least a bachelor's degree compared to 32% of the general population. Civilian assumptions that everyone who joins the military either has no other options or has the noblest of intentions are false. People join the military for a variety of reasons. Patriotism, college tuition, opportunity to travel, even family legacy. Fact two, our military serves a variety of purposes. Our military is not just a machine for shooting things and killing people. Our military builds foreign governments, it delivers aid in international crisis, it even assists in disaster relief here in the US, as we just saw in North Carolina. It is a robust institution with a broad array of missions far beyond just combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. Fact three, not everyone in the military uses firearms. Though I too appreciate Chris Hemsworth and Mark Wahlberg in uniform, Civilian assumptions that everyone in the military is infantry like them are misguided. While plenty of service members pull triggers in their primary roles, most of them don't. Actually, less than 20% of the military is in a combat arms role. There are people whose job it is to specialize in things like mechanics, intelligence, supply chain, even logistics. Fact four, civilian lifestyle is vastly different from military lifestyle. As I've traveled around the world and met military members and their families stationed with them, I've been struck by how different that is from my own lifestyle, having been born and raised in the same city until I left for college. By contrast, most military members move stations every two or three years, meaning their family picks up and moves with them too. This is not to say they're miserable doing so, but such a lifestyle has consequences, and I found that most of us don't recognize the sacrifices made by military families. Fact four, veterans can return to civilian life without being severely debilitated due to PTSD. A couple months ago, a friend of mine in the Army retired and began a civilian career. Early on, someone in his office brought up Afghanistan and looked at him terrified he'd set off some sort of unintentional loose cannon. My friend said he laughed and he told the guy, I've never even been deployed to the Middle East. Yes, physical and mental trauma can impact a vet's life, but the majority return without experiencing debilitating misfortunes and welcome any civilian genuinely engaging them about their time in the service. We must learn to talk about veterans without mythologizing all of them into the broken category. When Stanford was deciding whether to allow ROTC back on its campus just seven short years ago, a young student made the case for the program's reinstitution. 
She spoke, I know little to nothing of military lifestyles. Most of my knowledge comes from watching Pearl Harbor. That's not okay. It's not okay indeed. If your basis of knowledge and exposure to the military comes solely from Hollywood, I hope this talk has given you a glimpse, even a small glimpse, into the real military we so often celebrate. Next time you find yourself extending your hand to thank someone for their service, know what you're thanking them for. Offer gratitude, real gratitude, not empty platitudes and pedestals. Better yet, engage in a conversation. Ask them what they did and listen. Thank you.